First Sergeant Kev here with Company D, Second United States Sharpshooters. Thanks for joining me in the workshop. Today we are going to have an introductory conversation about painted cloth. Now, I've learned through my uh, years of researching this topic that the terminology can be very confusing. And because you'll, you'll find terms like oil cloth, painted cloth, enamel cloth, and you'll often see them used interchangeably, sometimes within the same source material. Uh, you'll find the terms used very specifically in different forums and different source material. So for the sake of this conversation, uh, aside from some specific examples, the term painted cloth uh, is going to refer to the application of some sort of covering or protective agent to a textile. Because when you are in, uh, in reenacting, you're going to have different applications for different products. Um, and it, they could also change for the time period too. So I'm trying to keep um, the topic a little broad in our introductory lesson. And the whole idea here is to um, help you get a little bit more background information to um, better narrow your research, help you ask more informed questions, and maybe uh, even guide your own uh, personal experimentation uh, with these sort of textile treatments at home. So in reenacting, we are very familiar with uh, painted fabrics. They were very common during the 19th century in all sorts of uses. And in the military, most of us spend plenty of night at an event sleeping on one of these ground claws. Uh, this is one made by Claude Sinclair. He makes excellent ground cloths. Not a sponsor, but I think everyone in Company D has their ground cloth from Sinclair. Um, see, it's got a nice uh, even gloss texture to it. Very long lasting, very durable. Um, if you're using uh, a double bag, uh, those were also painted as well. Now the formulas, they kind of change throughout history. They change by application. Uh, they could change by manual. Now the original recipes are often very difficult to recreate because most of those systems of measurement uh, no longer exist. And the other challenge, even if you look in the ordnance manual, for example, is those is, are the proportions. So the ordnance manual is making batches of things to supply an entire army and not a hobby maker trying to make um, one poke sack, for example. So that bit of calculating can be a challenge. Also looking online, um, you'll almost never find any complete how-to. You might get bits and pieces of different formulas. Um, you may not get any real background as to the how or why or how to finish it, the drying times, uh, how big the batch is, uh, personal notes and references. <clears throat> so I wanted to kind of address some of that. Um, uh, so far, I think the, the best source of information about oil cloth is on the Townsend's YouTube channel. Uh, he's done uh, a great video on making oil cloth, but he's also done some follow-up videos uh, about that too. So you may be asking, maybe if you're not into reenacting, um, why did they paint cloth back then? Um, well, long and short of it, it's... It made can uh, fabrics like canvas, sometimes drill, like the big blue tarp of the 19th century. Uh, they were really durable and uh, increased its water protective qualities. Uh, fabrics like canvas, for example, tend to be naturally waterproof once they get wet and the weave uh, swells and closes up all the holes. It, you know, you can make canvas buckets. All of our tents in the hobby are made out of canvas. So. Uh, you take a quality textile and then you coat it with uh, oil or, or paint and then you can increase essentially that, that vapor barrier or that water protective quality. So let's go ahead and start talking about uh, some of the products and some of my process that I've gone through so far. Before we get started with applying finishes to our textiles, we need to pre-treat the, the fabric in some way. And that pre-treatment uh, increases durability, but more importantly, it seals the canvas, for example, and prevents 
or mitigates bleed through of the finish. And one of the most common uh, pretreatments is clear wallpaper sizing. And uh, so you just, you have your fabric and you apply this evenly across the, the textile that you're using, let it dry and depending on what you're doing, you might need a second coat. I typically just use one coat. And what you'll notice is when you hold your fabric up to the light, uh, you should see none or hardly any light coming through that fabric. The whole idea with this is that it's sealing that weave um, and providing a foundation for your finish to bond to. And um, you can find this at hardware stores, uh, but I had a difficult time. I couldn't find it locally, so I ended up buying this on Amazon. I know uh, Captain Whitehall had a similar challenge where he lived, and so he ended up working with a paint store, and they sold him clear, untinted paint as a pretreatment, and that provided him excellent results as well. Now, some of you may be thinking to yourself, hey, first sergeant, they didn't have Zinsers clear wallpaper size during the Civil War. And right you are. So what did they use in the 19th century? They would have used um, some formula of a starch, and you can find recipes for those in uh, period receipt books on places like Google. And if you go that way, you'll want to uh, make your own swatch board so that as you dial in the, that formula for your, your starch mixture, you can figure out which of those different recipes provides you um, the, the best sealing and the best uh, bleed through protection. And make a note of that, and then you're ready to uh, experiment with your top coats. So um, the first one we are going to talk about is what I call the original recipe. And that is one part pure linseed oil, one part pure turpentine, lamp black as needed, and a splash of Japan dryer. This is very similar uh, to the recipe that you'll see Townsend's do. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about old timey formulas and give you some more research to pursue to see if you even want to try any of this yourself. Um, Missouri Boot and Shoe has a fantastic write-up on their website about, about why they don't use these historical formulas. Uh, they talk about all the ingredients in, in these modern chemicals that you get at hardware stores, uh, their concerns with that, as well as the combustion danger of products like linseed oils, because linseed oils, uh, like other oil, like some other oils, oxidize as they dry, and those oxidizing oils create heat. So if you're not careful with your, the disposal, disposal of your rags or the uh, drying of your textile, this stuff could catch on fire and burn everything down. So that is something for you uh, to consider and be thoughtful about. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I have my own precautions and I'm comfortable with the results. Uh, but that is my choice to make. So I highly recommend if you want to learn more information about the, the dangers uh, about using these sorts of mixtures, uh, check out their website for some more information. That being said, one of the common issues is like, you know, a lot of this stuff is bad for you. Uh, so I wanted to see if I could make a formula that was less bad for you. So rather than using modern hardware store boiled linseed oil with all of its crazy additives, I went with pure uh, food grade flaxseed oil. And then that I went with uh, absolutely pure turpentine. I found this stuff on eBay. None of this stuff is sponsored, um, but I found it on eBay and it's uh, distilled directly from South Georgia pines. And so this is this is pure, uh, unadulterated turpentine. It's expensive. It's a lot more expensive than the hardware store stuff, uh, but I don't use a lot of it, and I wanted to see what would happen. Uh, the third ingredient you're gonna see in a lot of these recipes is Japan Dryer. Uh, Japan Dryer is a very, very old paint additive, and it does what it says. It dries uh, paint 
and uh, mixtures faster. And my recipe, since I'm usually making really small batches, calls for a splash. And so when I made a tiny batch to make this oil cloth uh, poke sack, for example, I just used a couple of drops of Japan dryer to my little mixture. Um, if you're making a pint, you might be using, you know, a, a fourth of a capful. You do not use very much of this stuff at all. And I almost never find any exact measurements because we're hobby makers. So we're, it's kind of a, uh, a dial it in as you go sort of process. So I just use a little bit of this and it speeds up the drying time. When I made, when I painted this with the oil cloth recipe in the middle of summer, um, I mean, each coat dried, uh, within, dried to the touch within maybe 15 minutes. I was pretty uh, impressed with how quickly that it dried to the touch, but I left it hang to air out for a couple of days before I started sewing it. And since we're working on military goods, I'm predominantly interested in uh, cut, like shades of black because haversacks, knapsacks, um, ground claws, they're all painted black. And so that's my area of focus. Uh, during the time period, you would find a wide array of colors and <clears throat> the availability of this stuff was much more widespread. I think there was a manufacturing process patented in 1849 that was able to like mass produce uh, painted fabrics. And I even heard uh, stories in my research that in the 19th century, you could go to like general stores and buy this sort of material um, by the yard, as well as uh, vulcanized uh, fabric too, which, man, wouldn't that be nice today? Um, but uh, since I'm working in black, uh, I need to add a pigment. And one of the most common uh, pigments of the 19th century is this very messy and very effective stuff called lamp black. Uh, I'm not gonna open it because it's super fine and just touching the bag, it just, it gets everything messy. If you've reenacted or you've camped out, used an oil lamp, you're familiar, you've seen lamp black. It's the soot that collects on the inside of the globes, uh, but for art, uh, artistic purposes, it's highly refined and dried out so that you can mix it um, for your various paint tints. And you can find this stuff fairly easily at uh, most online art supply stores, and maybe if you have a good one local, they might have a small amount. You definitely don't need a bag that big. Um, and then uh, Japan or lamp black as needed. I would just little bits. Uh, when I uh, mixed my for my batch for this, I added too much lamp black, and so when this dried, I guess the undissolved lamp black kind of just collected on the surface. And when I was sewing it, my hands looked like this. And so it's all fine now, like the excess is all wiped off and it doesn't come off anymore. But that's something to keep in mind is to kind of sneak up on your, your pigment and a little bit goes a long way. <clears throat> so when we get into the safer applications, we get into latex paints and different paints will provide you a different finish. So right here, you'll see one coat of Rust-Oleum semi-gloss that I used. And I used that when I made my ration bag. Um, I'm gonna put food into this, so I don't want this stuff touching my food. So that's another important consideration to keep in mind. So one coat right here, and then this bottom one is one coat untreated. So this is what latex bleed through will look like on untreated canvas. And since the oil mixture is a lot thinner, that's sort of fairly typical bleed through on an oil finish. So you can experiment with different, num uh, different amounts of coats for your latex paints, different brands, for example. And then over here, we go into the gloss paints. So you can already start to see the shine start to sneak up. So one coat is, so we have the darkest, least dark, and now we're getting darker again. And as we put a second coat on, we start to get that familiar 
shine that we normally see on our ground claws and our haversacks. And then this last one has a top coat applied to it. So there is our top coat recipe. And the top coat, now you don't need to apply it because if you're going the nice modern safe route, you're gonna cancel out all the safety precautions you took by applying the top coat. But the top coat is something you will see written about a lot in forums. <clears throat> and it's it's something that you know I personally like the finish. And um, I think uh, when uh, Captain Whitehall made our flag um, sleeves, he uh, did the top coat, gave it a nice shine. And the top coat also adds to the flexibility of the fabric. You can see, that with the two coats of paint, you know, this is a little pretty crunchy and it doesn't, you know, lay flat that well, but you could, you could hang it differently or you could stretch it out when you paint it. But you can see with the top coat, it lays as flat as if it was just uh, treated with wallpaper size. And you get uh, a little bit more gloss and a lot of that's going to be the, the oil. So the top coat makes your... Uh, one part turpentine, one part linseed oil, and a splash of Japan dryer. And um, that's sort of like your, your finished coat if you want to go that way. You would be fine if you just experiment with your gloss paints, if that's the way that you wanted to go, and call it good. And when I applied my top coat, I you know just did that little swatch, and I stuck it in my empty burn bucket because uh, I made that mid-fall and it was always cold in my shop and that took forever to dry. I think dry to the touch was maybe a week and so I just left it empty, you know, my empty burn bucket so for whatever reason it started to smolder it wasn't going to hurt anything. So that was the safety precaution that I took and I, of course I didn't have any problems because mostly it needs to be crumpled up with a bunch of other stuff but I wasn't going to take any chances because I hadn't done it before. But uh, I hope this bit of information has been helpful. Um, this is, these are the brands of paint that I used in my samples, if you're curious. Um, like I said, we're, we're not experts in this field, but we, we've dabbled in painted cloth for some time. And I, I hope in the process that you've learned a little bit about the, the history, the safety, the importance of experimenting um, as you recreate the past. Um, and that you learn a little bit more about the terminology so that you can have uh, a more informed uh, discussion. It could guide your research a little bit more and maybe even give you uh, a better foundation for your own experimentation. You, so when you want to learn about paint finishes, you may want to be specific about what you're trying to recreate because um, that, that can make a big difference in you know speeding up what they're what they're talking about you want to if you don't want this straight oil finish you want like a painted finish uh be specific and that'll help you out in the long run so let us know if uh you have any questions uh we'll help any way we can um if not we'll refer you to someone who's probably much more knowledgeable in this area than we are um as always thank, thanks for liking and subscribing and if you'd like to learn more about Civil War reenacting or Berdan sharpshooters, be sure to check us out at secondusss.com. We'll see you next time.